Contrast Security enables organizations to secure their applications from development to production. By embedding security sensors within software, Contrast automatically and continuously detects vulnerabilities in both custom and open source code while developers write code, providing them with context-specific how-to-fix guidance for easy and fast remediation. At the same time, by identifying only true vulnerabilities that pose risk and eliminating those that do not, Contrast empowers developers and security teams to prioritize and focus on only those vulnerabilities that matter. Learn how Contrast can help you secure your applications from development through production at securityweekly.com forward slash contrast. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just spoke with Christian Ryu, aka Dildog, about how AppSec's present needs to move beyond its past into a world of sandboxed apps and decorated data. This is the news segment where we put the present into perspective in apparently a very alliterative manner. I'm still your host, Mike Shima, and I'm still here with Mr. John Kinsella. And unfortunately, I still have to read a bunch of announcements before we get into the news. So. This is called keeping you in suspense. Uh, let's see, what's our announcement? Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to subscribe on any of our podcast feeds and have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. And hopefully you've subscribed to ASW. If not, do so now because I have one more announcement to read while you're clicking. Join us January 20th to learn how to build your own security lab at home. I might even be there. Then join us February 16th to learn about validation techniques within applications. Finally, because good things come in three, join us March 2nd to learn five things you can do to catch more bad guys. Don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. And Mr. John Kinsella, we still don't have a tagline or motto for the show, but we do have tons of news to go through. And um, before we get into the news, just want to say Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to all of our listeners. Happy New Year. You know, I think um, this could be an interesting set of news. Uh, we've been off air for, what, a few <laughs> weeks? And I've, I've, you know, I usually sort of bookmark stuff as I go along and I've lost track of what I've bookmarked. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got all sorts of good stuff. So let's dig in. We dig in. Now, you, you said, of course, you said all sorts of good stuff, and I have to completely <sighs> derail us by talking about Log4J. But I'm really just kind of going to do this real quickly, and we're not going to turn Log4J into the, well, let's turn it into the cliche that we make fun of from maybe the AppSec perspective, because really I just wanted to pull out an, a, an article that's saying the FTC is turning its eyes towards any enterprises that aren't taking security seriously, um, meaning Log4J. But one of the reasons I highlighted that is that Log4J is kind of just one of a number of zero days vulns that have come out that highlights whether or not teams, organizations have a good maturity behind them. And here I'm thinking of things like egress filtering, as we were just talking with Dildog, or things like, you know, good software composition analysis. So I think rather than talking about Log4J specifically and diving into JNDI and all that, just more of trying to use that as the example of there's some basics that we need to be focusing on as the AppSec community rather than chasing a bunch of bugs and going down that bug ops route, which is the anti-pattern to follow, and turning it back into a, a DevOps route of basically security as software quality. So that's my soapbox, and that's the most I'm going to beat the dead horse of Log4J. Not sure if uh, you want to venture into that topic, Mr. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the reins from your hands and, and make a very sharp left turn here. Um, and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to. Um, I think I should. I think it's important to our listeners. Um, Let's go. And of interest. So looking at particularly at this blog post, which you, you mentioned from the record, um, they talk about FTC and Log4J. And then the second half of that article um, is quoting our dear friends over at Microsoft who uh, decided to stick their nose into this mess before Christmas and start telling us about, not just telling us about Log4j, but also how to fix it. Um, and, and my point here is, is um, I, I'm editorializing a little bit. I'm, I apologize, Ned. Well, at the time. Um, <laughs> Stay in your lane. Uh, it, we've got we've got two or three other stories here. I've posted something into our Discord about you know another error message from just from from these guys, and we've had lots of conversations about this over the last year. And hopefully, I think one of my New Year's resolutions is to talk less about this particular company. 
But when you've got so many problems going on and you're not a vendor that's selling Log4j, maybe you should not be doing a PR move and trying to get your nose into the attention of the media by talking about Log4j when your scanner is actually not working. Um, so that's my piece. And I'm, I'm going to shut up and let's move on. About that? <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll take back those metaphorical reins and uh, put us on to the path of saying that, in fact, you know, one of the things, one of the aspects of articles that we often see and here, I'll jump on some editorialize of my own is this is the CVSS number or here are the number of potential, you know, the, the potential devices that can be exposed or here are the number of apps running this or here are the number of attacks. And quite honestly, th those might be interesting, but I don't think they're necessarily informative because it doesn't really matter so much that here is a lot of attack traffic or here's a lot of people probing for Log4j. You can kind of ignore most of that and just say, did we have our SCA? Did we have our, our ducks in a row, to use a different metaphor than horses, <laughs> to say, do we have, you know, uh, you know, what what does our quality approach to software look like? Do we have observability? Are we dealing with our dependency and our rest crates like uh, Christian was talking about? And I think the other thing I will highlight is that, yes, as the um, as really popular vulnerabilities get identified in 2021, there was another one on in Exchange, your friends again, Mr. Kinsella, uh, mm. that, that was a whole new attack surface that was being exposed, broken apart, researchers looking into. And here I did pull another article that was a, a, a neat write-up on some research about H2 database that had a similar vulnerability in, in, in the JNDI. And really I highlighted that in the sense of Suddenly, we have that that observer bias, if you will, that people are starting to look and say, oh, this is cool. It's either a technology I wasn't familiar with, let me go understand it, break it apart, or this is a technology I'm very familiar with. Hey, by the way, did you all know that you can do this deserialization, you know, remote calling from objects? And if you're doing remote instantiation from objects, why are you doing this from, you know, remote instances that you're not doing authentication, let alone authorization with? So I think mm -hmm. those are the application security lessons that I really wanted to pull out of there rather than um, mention that that particular vuln that shall not be named. Yeah. You, you know, um, on on the I can't remember if this is a public mailing list or not. There was a discussion going on on a mailing list for an open source community um, around security, but they were talking about, um, oh, there's not you know hackers don't really focus on any particular product um, after a vulnerability has been announced. If a vulnerability comes out, it's just sort of it's a vulnerability. Everyone keeps going. I'll I'll, I'll call. Um, BS on that, and I think this is going to be a really interesting example over the next two three months. Let's let's Mike let's sort of mark the calendar between now and let's say April. Mm -hmm. My prediction is we'll go start seeing this same type of JNDI ish, um, um, you know, remote execution or ability to do injection like this. I think we're going to start seeing uh, the researchers finding a lot more of this type of thing. So I'll, I'll I'll say we're going to say three to five more vulnerabilities of this type in the next three four months. How about that? Yeah, th that that is interesting, and I think uh, to help bolster your case, you even pulled in another vuln in exchange. Now, I think I yeah. didn't have time to look and see who the researchers were here, or how this was identified, um, but the fact that 2021 had a lot of named vulns for exchange, um, here's an interesting one in a year flip. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so my point here is is really not about the exchange itself, believe it or not. So, mm -hmm. um, God, I can't find the tab. Uh but what was good? Yeah, there it is. That yeah, it is. Um, in a nutshell, many exchange administrators recognized um, when they were waking up, hopefully not hungover on January 1st, that they were no longer receiving mail because uh, their exchange on-prem exchange server um, had a date flip issue. So once it hit January 1st, 2022, it stopped uh, delivering mail. Um, and this is actually a bug. Uh, um, they're calling it Y2 20, Y2K22. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that quite rolls off the tongue, but there you go. Um, but while this is a bug, the, the reason I put this in here um, is not so much about this one in particular, I think really around this. And I think we've got another story in here similar to this. Uh, but there's at least two things we've got in this week, which are really testing issues. Um, yes. And it comes back to, you know, we were talking about testing a few weeks ago, and, you know, we just had Christian on here. We were talking about, um, again, the testing and how we do some of this type of thing. You know, security really does, does come down to software quality. So here's the thought process and sort of what's been going on in my head in the last few weeks, and we'll keep going. 
probably for the next three, four months, um, is how do we test for this type of thing? If if you're a if you're a small org with like me right now with you know two developers, um, I'm I'm lucky if I can get a good number of unit tests done right now. Right, I'm I'm doing a pretty good job, but still that that takes struggle away from actually writing code and developing features. If you are a large org with, we'll say ten thousand plus developers, um, I expect you have a little more budget. So I'm, again, I'm not. This is not about finger pointing. This is really about mm -hmm. how does a small guy versus a large guy work. If you're a large company, you've got more time to spend on QA. You've got a QA team. You've got automation teams. You're able to write that type of thing. But still, how do you think of all these different cases, right? Does does someone go back in September before you go into the, the Christmas code freeze? Hmm, New Year. Um, maybe we should go and take one of our test systems and just like flip the year forward by about six months or the date forward by about six months and see what happens. Um, you're probably not going to think that you're like, wow, Y2K, that's, you know, that was... 22 years ago, I had to do the math. Um, <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying? Like, how do you how do you figure out what you're going to test? Like, it's, you know, you can be, testing is yes. something, and security in general is something you can be very creative about, which is part of why I like security, right? Um, you're able to, it really comes down to the art of looking at something from a different way than than maybe the quote-unquote normal person or the developer who wrote it did. And that's what a good QA person is, they're creative. But how creative should you be getting in your testing, um, to find some of those things, would a f I mean, maybe you could say a fuzzer had found this if you had the fuzzer playing with the the, the your what system clock or something. I don't know. So it's 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 that's really the, there's a really interesting um, thought process around that. For I think, like I said, we've got one or two other issues in here around this. It's like really comes down to how do you test for that? Um, the fix was very easy. They got it on emergency fix quite quickly. But how do you find just a basic bug like that in the first place? Yeah, that's a great point. And I tried to, I, I, I like to be clever uh, in, in that vein and talk about, mm. you know, QA testing tends to be, you know, looking at use cases and security testing tend to be looking at abuse cases and thinking about how can you be clever about that? Mm -hmm. And um, lots of different people, you don't have to be an infosec to become up, to come up with those abuse cases or the, you know, what could go wrong. And mm -hmm. one of the other things I think that's a good tie in here that came across both of our radars is the uh, long names and home kit make things break. And here's here is honestly a quite classic type of basic security testing, let alone even a QA testing. In this case, a researcher said, I'm going to name my HomeKit device a 500,000 character name. And lo and behold, it not only did it accept that name, but then the iPhone app completely bricks the phone. And what's unfortunate, the reason it was called out as a kind of a permanent DOS against the phone, is that if you re, you know, restore, reboot, and then try to resync to your iCloud account that has the name of this uh, HomeKit device, once again, you're back in this mm -hmm. Sisyphean uh, infinite loop of 500,000 character uh, device names. And it's one of those things to say, clearly 500,000 is pretty bad. What should have been, what could have been the reasonable limit on a human friendly name for for these devices yeah um and this comes back you know to, to bring it to circle it back to the previous discussion again um as christian was saying is is you know this is the problem we have with using our default internal um data types in pretty much any modern language modern or not right it's it doesn't care it's like this field is an integer okay well well let's say this field is a um unsigned integer. It's always going to be possible. Maybe that's a little bit better, but still not by a hell of a lot. So um, <laughs> yeah, th this was a second issue I was foreshadowing too, that's again, testing based, but really it does come down back to what can we do, you know, with the languages? It's a constant thing. Every time I add a new API or any of us, it's like, okay, where's my validator? Is my validator actually checking all the fields? Is it using decent checks or have I done all that type of stuff? Then how do I test against that? And that that's all that type of stuff that I just talked through, that's the majority of the work, right? If I'm if I'm running an API that takes a like let's see, this case was a, a, a you know a, a device name. I've got an API, mm -hmm. I take a device name, um, I go and I call the data stores, which will store it to disk and then if necessary store it up to iCloud. Call it 20 lines of code, right? That all that stuff is leveraging libraries we've already written. Now let's take a step back and talk about that validator. Okay, well, um, does it have you know invalid characters in it? Is it too long? Is is there maybe do we care about reserved words? All these different types of things I got to check for there. Then I have to write the test to actually go through and test that again. That's probably going to be more than the code. Well, almost definitely going to be more than the code to actually do the thing itself. So 
the problem there is we're making our software developers be test writers or someone has to be a test writer. And that's, um, I think that's the, the part where none of us have big smiles about when we come time to do this. <laughs> um, and, and that's hopefully, you know, if, if that becomes improved in rust with what we were talking about, that'd be amazing. Um, so I'll cross my fingers for that. Yes, that was that was definitely the the laugh cry we both had in response to, yeah. <laughs> to what you were saying there. And I wanted to hi highlight two things, or one thing at least, is that you know the um, obviously the the HomeKit issue is what what brought this across uh, th this mm -hmm. particular article into our attention. But in the past, we've also seen just long strings. What could go wrong? Well, if you have a long string that you can submit as a password, that's a great algorithmic type of DOS. Meaning, if you can have a just a one bit megabyte, one gigabyte password for that matter, you could spike a CPU as the application tries to run bcrypt on it, just to compare the the the, the hash of whatever this ridiculous mm -hmm. password is against what it's stored. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things that could potentially happen when you have these not quite unbounded, but pretty significantly largely bounded uh, strings. And what you're talking about there, uh, John, just now about testing, uh, that's I think is a great segue, so thank you very much for that, into CDN cache poisoning. And this is a topic that typically I will have to admit that I have you know a bias of a, almost a yawn every time I come across cash poisoning because it's sort of a yeah okay but it, it tends to need a lot of what if scenarios and kind of the the planets must align before this to be effective or to have a real impact. The researcher in this case wrote up a couple great examples of how they got paid bounties for it. So that's legit. You know, researcher found some bugs, got paid. Those bugs got fixed. But the fundamental or a fundamental aspect of this from a AppSec perspective is the normalization. And it's these normalization mismatches that make this CDN, you know, this cache poisoning pretty consequential, both from this the sense of how do you normalize casing? What about paths, directories, including dot, dot, slash? So, yep, again, I'll, another one of my <laughs> biases. You got my attention with that. In a URL fragment, and that fragment is actually used as part of the key into pointing to different uh, cached items. So so that was all pretty interesting, and it, both in the sense of URLs, headers, and that, sure, they look like ASCII. They look like, you know, just human-readable text. But suddenly, casing, spaces, dashes, all of those little nuances make a big difference when they come into how this HTTP1 server, HTTP2 server, this, this you know, Nginx, Apache, IIS, et cetera, are handling each of these different uh, strings. So lots of work still to be done, it seems. Yeah. Um, in general, HTTP caching is, um, it's a, black art right you know it's um you're trying to balance it's it's a band-aid used to make a user experience as um fast as possible um but the thing is for that band-aid to really stick and help heal you've got to have all these sort of things in place to make it um more difficult to work with and then you have to be able to support something like uh um being able to flush out that cache if I want to put it on a new page or something, right? How do you figure out when to expire and all these type of things? So you get stuff like this. It, it's um, it's obviously, uh, um, when it works right, it, it's uh, hugely beneficial. I mean, look at where Cloudflare, Cloudflare has gone over the last um, mm -hmm. decade or so. Um, but still, it's it's there's going to be these edge cases, edge cases which are found, and um, they're sort of painful when they are. They are. Now, speaking of painful, here's something that's going to be painful for um, John to restrain himself, listener. So let's see what happens. So our friends at Wiz, well, we don't know them personally, but uh, they're friends because they've written up a lot of uh, findings in Azure Cloud that we've highlighted here. They found another vulnerability, and this one isn't necessarily that particularly exciting, but highlighting it because it's, I think it falls quite nicely into that theme of testing. So uh, within Azure, you could have a, what, what's what they're calling a, a local Git directory, which is pretty much self-explanatory. You could have your .git repo served out of your web root. Now, some folks at Microsoft saw that and said, it's probably a bad idea just to serve our source code, you know, that, that's potentially supposed to be internal only out of the web root. So uh, we'll add a web.config file to it and we'll tell IIS not to serve the .git directory, meaning keep the source code, you know, local as it were. Unfortunately, there, well, there were two problems. One minor problem is that the config had a typo, but it's a good thing. It failed secure, so the, the that directory still wasn't served out of IIS as it parsed the uh, misconfigured configuration. 
But IIS is not the only web service out there. And so if you have something like PHP, Node, Ruby, others that the uh, researchers highlight in their article, that Git directory is going to get served. So it's just kind of the interesting thing that it's sort of partial credit for considering the threat model, but partial credit fails completely in terms of security because it's so trivially bypassed in the, in the sense of users make a mistake. And this is sort of the, I guess, call, called a foot gun type of situation that, that can happen within, within Azure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I'm going to, uh, begin my uh, um, my dry January of, of not speaking about the folks from Redmond. I've, I've, I saw this before Christmas. I didn't put it on the list because I am trying to minimize my talking. Um, yeah, nothing to add. No, no problem. They called it, uh, what they call it? The the legit bug will say, John, you're, you're now too legit to quit. So you've stopped your uh, discussion <laughs> of uh, Microsoft there. You know, I, I will say one thing, though, um, in, in quite positive and happy. Hey, Wiz guys, if any of you guys want to come on the show, we'd love to have you. You're doing some amazing research. Um, we'd love to talk about, to you about it in person. So if anybody over there knows someone at Wiz, um, you know, hook us up. Yes, please reach out. We uh, we review suggestions monthly is what the cliche, yeah, that's my word of the day, apparently. That's what the announcement says, but uh, reach out to us directly. We'll love to uh, fast track you and do a good chat about what the research you've been doing. I think this is also a chance to turn our attention towards some positive things. Now, we highlight bugs not to pick on bugs or honestly or pick on what happens with them. We use those bugs, especially well-written write-ups, to demonstrate communication styles, to demonstrate how to learn about AppSec. And the reason I'm kind of uh, going in, uh, into this a little bit uh, more verbose is that we've kicked off 2022, a new year, new show, and I want to give uh, just a sense to listeners what they can expect throughout the next several months. One of the things they can expect is some discussion of tools. And here is one from the TLDRSEC newsletter talking about SEMGREP, as uh, Clint has wanted to do, since that is uh, what, his, his, what, what pays the bills for him right now. But what stood out to me in this example of SEMGREP is it wasn't the tool used to find vulnerabilities, which is a common thing. Common taint tracking is what Christian was talking about, you know, quite a bit in the, in our last segment. And you do this successfully by building the, the AST of an application. So now you have semantic understanding of the application and you can make a good distinction between this is a function name or this is a function argument versus this is a uh, uh, documentate. This is a comment, and that way, having that semantic understanding means you can avoid a lot of false positives within that type of um, source code analysis. But what you can also do if you have an AST is build it and then modify it. And in this case, it was being modified in a way to create some to improve some default configurations. So I thought that I I mentioned that maybe once or twice last year, but here was a really good example of what, that I just wanted to reinforce is looking at a tool like SEMGREP to not just find the flaws, but find and refactor your code into something better. So uh, you know, that's the uh what is it? We we don't have security week AppSec, you know, application security weekly awards, but um, that we we'll just make one up on the spot, and this goes to the award for January of getting my attention. <laughs> um, one clarification on this first, uh, I think this is written by Jamie Flanagan from uh, Terra, uh, excuse yes. me, HashiCorp, not yes, by uh, our, our buddy Clint over, who's also doing the TLDR stuff. Um, and uh, you know, as you know, welcome new listeners. Happy 2022 to all of you. Uh, for some of you who might be tuning in here, this is also a good example of when um, uh, Mike and I don't always agree. He thought this would be a positive, <laughs> happy thing to talk about. He forgot that I spent a good chunk of last year working for an IAC security company, and I am um, getting great flashbacks of the trash fire, which is IAC security. So, um, with that said, uh, I didn't know that SEMGREP was doing auto effects. I thought that was interesting, so I dug into this article. Um, even with, even with once you have that parser and once you have that model done as you're describing, um, this type of stuff is is fairly complex. Um, so it it's I mean it, a lot of this is being made easier by SEMGREP, and that's what's made this as, as mm -hmm. short as this blog post is. But at the end of the day, um, you know if you look at a Terraform script, um, which if I remember I I always get it backwards YAML, yes YAML. Um, so if you throw that into your normal Go parser or any type of little off-the-shelf parser and there's a bug in there, he's going to come back and say, error at line one, column one. And if you look at that, that's going to be your open curly brace, not the actual line number. So actually figuring out where this is in there, it's 
a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, so you have to have a separate YAML parser that actually does the parsing versus the display. And then, as he was saying, that comes back to the line number issue in there with how you find it. Um, so it, it is, if, if someone wants to, you know, if, you know, IAC is still quite popular, it's still something that um, the scanners are super important to be able to run through your code, make sure that you're not having wide open doors as, as we were talking about again in that last segment, which we keep referencing. It was a good segment. I hope you've listened to it. Um, but if you're doing IAC, you need to do some sort of scanning. Uh, this gives you a sense of the difficulty behind um, parsing those languages and running with them, mm -hmm. not from a security point of view, but also from the runtime point of view. So if you wonder why in Terraform things seem like why haven't they added this one little feature which seems so simple to me? Um, beside the fact there's quite a lot of issues open on the HashiCorp uh, uh, site around that, and people asking, why haven't you implemented all these things? Because they're fairly difficult, but it gives you a sense of, of why that actually is. So um, neat article. I'd love to hear more people talking about actually doing um, autofix with um, SemGrep um, or any of these tools. I know my previous employer was doing autofix, but that was not the public so open source version. Um, it, it's pretty difficult to do. So um, fun space to, to get into for the CS nerds who want to think about compiler stuff. Indeed. And everybody has good test suites so that these auto fixes can just roll through cleanly. So um, oh, I'm sure definitely. that's what the case is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, see, we do agree on things occasionally, Mr. Gonzalo. Um, but we also bring in a, a positive aspect of looking into looking back on to 2021. You highlighted an article from, um, I think, on the, from Port Swigger and yep. uh, the Port Swigger site. And I, I highlighted just uh, Thinkscape's quarterly Q4. Q for 2021, um, just about you know what what happened last year. So start us off with some things that stood out for you. Yeah, so um, our buddies over at Port Swigger uh, with their awesome blog they've been working on the last well it's been on our radar the last year or so. Um, they you know let let's look at positive. Let's stop being snarky for a second and and you know let's start the timers. Let's see how long we can stay. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know let's actually look at some positive things here. So they've got I think it's seven or eight things in this list. Um, solar winds. One of the interesting ones is Supreme Court liberates security research, uh, talking about how um, they've put uh, they've sort of narrowed down uh, some of the um, uh, aspects of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act (CFAA) here in the U.S. Uh, and when that would actually be used to actually try and sue a hacker because we consider that bad. OWASP Top 10 got a refresh. We talked about that a lot last year. Um, so they actually have some good points in here, uh, which uh, um, you know remind us that we are actually making improvements, and um, it's not old grizz not all old grizzly uh, security people going, damn it, why isn't this getting any better? So uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There's also really interesting research that's been going on, and uh, that's yeah. what the Thinkst has been highlighting their quarterly reviews of it, which is really neat. And mm -hmm. I, I highlighted for two reasons. One, it's just a great format of how a way to summarize a whole bunch of technical talks. With here's a summary of what the researchers talked about. Here are two key takeaways, and here's an image that illustrates some key point or gives some flavor for what the conversation, you know, the, what that conference presentation was like. And I read that with the idea of, oh, this is actually pretty interesting if you work in AppSec product security teams and are trying to distill a lot of complex information about various risks, about various threat models into a report that probably won't be, you know, a, a 50, 60 page PDF, but that spirit of what's the summary, what are the takeaways, what's something that really highlights the flaws that you're, or the risks that you're highlighting. So there's a communication aspect there I want to highlight, as well as just what's notable. And uh, it's the type of thing that maybe you, you might not have Azure Active Directory endpoints in your environment, or hopefully you're not dealing with ransomware negotiation now after Log4j, but there, the, this uh, Article highlights a couple. Uh, 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 I'm losing my my uh, words here as my cat's coming to step on the keyboard. As uh, com presentations on, on these topics, and it's pretty neat to talk to just to see what's going on in the industry, where is industry moving towards, and what can we learn about other things. So, some cool cool stuff to to read about as you as you start the year off. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. This is 30 pages of cool stuff to read. Um, and the stat that caught my eye is they've got a table on, I don't know, page four, um, talking about where they've gathered all this data from. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got an eyeball. It looks like about 20 different talks, excuse me, 20 different conferences, a total of 652 different talks. So they've done some good summarization for you here. It's 30 pages, and that sounds like a lot until you realize it's 600 pages, excuse me, 600 papers that they are sum summarizing. So, um, 
definitely grab a copy. Um, great read. These guys are always doing awesome stuff. Um, I always look forward to this one. So uh, I'll, I'll stop talking and give you more time to read it. How about that? Sounds good. I think the other thing that I was that also caught my eye is that an article um, again from um, the record about Salesforce to require MFA mm. for all of their users, and this stood out as a positive thing to me because one, that's just a very forceful move towards MFA, and we saw in 2021 Google is starting to do this with uh, their Gmail as well, just saying. We're going to require MFA because it has a 99 percent, a very very high percent um, success rate against blocking the most types of phishing accounts and uh, phishing attacks and account takeovers. What's interesting about this too is that Salesforce is also drawing the line in their threat model and, and stating that if you have a one-time passcode that's being delivered, you know, the TOTP. Um, something like that, they're saying the delivery mechanism cannot be email or SMS text messages. And they're highlighting basically just saying that those me delivery mechanisms are much more prone to compromise. They're they're easier to mm -hmm. target rather than getting perhaps physical access to grab your phone from an authenticator app or ideally from a something like a, a YubiKey or a, you know, your, your touch ID that can use a web auth N. So that's a really awesome move forward. And hopefully we're now in the era of, you know, we've gone beyond the 90s era of HTTPS everywhere, and we're getting into MFA everywhere. And that MFA has a little asterisk that says essentially, you know, web off M or U2F type of, you know, FIDO backed types of really strong authentication. Yeah, good MFA everywhere. Um, yeah. This was interesting. I saw it, um, you know, I, 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 I gave it a nod and kept going. So I'm glad you, you brought it into the stories. Um, it, you know, first, the story sort of, it, it's interesting to me. I, I was working last week and I worked most of the holidays. Um, but it wasn't until this morning that I realized I was accessing a lot more of my, I'd having, I was having to access a lot more of my, my um, tokens to log into various properties, which makes me wonder, was I actually really working the last week or two? I sure thought I was, but um, <laughs> I'm now authenticating to multiple things today, which I hadn't had to authenticate to in the last few weeks. So maybe my work just changed. Um, and then a question to think about both for you and our audience um, as we look at this and what they support. I don't think I've heard yet of any of the... Um, uh, I'll say multi-factor authenticators, providers of of size of of note. Um, I don't think I've seen any of them supporting doing uh, um, providing tokens over the secondaries, right? Either um, a Slack or Teams or um, uh, WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal. I mean, it's at least mm -hmm. particularly the last two or three, that seems like that could be a legitimate way. That's um, a little more a little more better than than the the texting. Um, and be curious to see if if they start venturing into that space or or no that that's I haven't seen it yet maybe they don't I, I would consider Signal at least be secure, um, maybe they don't have a good authentication path in there or something to be able to make that happen. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting thought um, thought process there because it gets into the idea of threat modeling and thinking about compromising the app and signals identity based on just your phone number, which yeah. maybe that's exposed, you know, that that's part of the, the SIM swapping um, risk that they're, that, mm -hmm. that Salesforce is highlighting here. But, you know, something like WhatsApp with end-to-end -end encryption has stronger authentication of those, those endpoints, you know, the identities involved here, maybe that is that uh, a path for, you know, um, what am I getting at? The push uh, or, or touch or, or something for your mm. TATP. TOTP. Um, this is where you listeners, this is our real time threat modeling discussion as we brainstorm now. <laughs> Thanks for the <laughs> good, good derailing question. Well, not derailing, but good, uh, good question there, John. Uh, we are wrapping up though. We've only got half an hour for these segments. They go by quickly, but I did want to, as is my want, uh, reach back into the past. And this was actually a, uh, for, for two reasons. One, a vulnerability that was released on January, early, I think January 4th tw in 2000 from Dildog himself um, about a the Pam Slam vulnerability, which at the time was pretty well known or, or pretty um, 
uh, popular. And what's neat about it, it was just, again, has a dot, dot, slash as part of the attack payload. And it was demonstrating how to bypass the uh, pluggable authentication module within Linux, specifically Red Hat, and point to an alternate configuration file that was that could lead to a local privilege escalation. And the reason I'm highlighting that is that it was also the type of bug that is not necessarily, that is not a... Um, a memory safety issue. So while I will be a big extoller of moving towards Go, moving towards Rust, I still want, don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are still plenty of vulnerabilities that we can see that are not memory safety issues that have plagued us in the past that I'm sure are going to hit us in the future. So that's a little bit of my parting thoughts for this uh, opening episode of 2022. Uh, John, where, where, let us know where, what, let, peek us, let, let us peek inside of your brain. What, what, what are you thinking of <laughs> as we, after 2022? Oh, don't do that to our listeners. That would be horrible. Um, I, I liked this uh, uh, this little uh, story you threw in here from the point of view of when you read through it and you look at the the, the downloads, the available fixes. Uh, one of the ones as mentioned is uh, the good old Deck Alpha, which was near and dear to my heart. So that brought back <laughs> some fond memories. Um, yeah, let's have a good 2022. What I really want as usual is more feedback from our listeners. So guys, reach out and talk to me. Um, you can find us on the 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 well, not the Slacks, the uh, Discords or the Twitters or the LinkedIn. Um, we 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 want to know. I'm presuming you're tired of hearing me talk about the guys in Redmond because I'm tired of hearing me talk about. So I'm going to stop that. Um, but what would you like on the, the positive notes? What was your favorite thing you saw from us last year? What would you like us to do more of? Um, any feedback? Uh, I will let you glance inside a little bit of my head, and I will take your feedback and put it into my head. How about that? That's an excellent note. So yeah, uh, go go tell us in Discord what you're thinking. And uh, I think that's a good note to end on. So thank you for that, John. I want to thank all of our listeners. And thank you once again for joining us in 2022. Remember to subscribe to the show. Check out the show notes. And if you like my if you like industrial music and you like my reference to Soylent Green, uh, check out Wump's Gun. Soylent Green is mentioned Fleisch. So that's your uh, music track to hack by for the week. And with that, we'll see you next week on Application Security Weekly.